So what else can you do? Right? I talked a little bit about the digital space and I can't address all the solutions, but what else can you do? Well, watch them on the floor. If you have like say diagrams, recipes, uh, finance sheets, um, HR documents that are in folders somewhere and they're out and about and you have employees constantly moving through this space, if they don't need access to it, lock that information away. You know, put it in a filing cabinet. You know, do something to take it out of the general circulation. Uh, the importance here is that it reduces the risk of accidental exposure. It reduces the risk of uh, intentional exposure. If you have a digital break-in and someone is stealing permissions of different employees, they can't jump, right? We talked about how we're locking the roles down. They can't jump into all different from like sales into finance because they don't have access. Well, the same thing happens if you have a stranger who walks through your, your company and you have files out on the desk everywhere. You know, if it's just sitting on the desk, you might not notice if they grab it, but if they go lean over and unlock a filing cabinet, hopefully someone's gonna know. And that's the mentality you need to take. You know, um, and we talk again in training and everything about the culture, but you know, think about this stuff because it really does make such a huge difference in how you approach um, your business. So the scary word here is encryption for a lot of businesses. What's that mean? Um, and I think a lot of small businesses think that means it's gonna cost me something. And so what is encryption? Encryption is where you take the data that's sitting in your digital landscape and you jumble it all up so that when you first look at it, it looks like nonsense and you need to decrypt it in order to read it, right? So why is it so important? Well, if you have some of those records, especially things you need to retain for long periods of time that are just sitting there, you know, you would absolutely want your attacker um, this bad actor who's trying to get into your things to look at this stuff and say, I can't use it. Even if I get it, I can't use it. Number one, they might just stop attacking you. Um, and number two, if they do attack you, your risk is mitigated because they can't do anything with the data. So which data do you encrypt? How do you go through this process? I think your first step is to always look at your high sensitivity data. What is that data that means most to me and most to my attackers? Um, and I would strongly recommend that when we talk about this, if you have a data backup solution, and I'll bring this up again for data backup la later, but your backup solution should probably be encrypted too. So the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, as it's called, has uh, a standard that they call, that they call FIPS 140-2. Uh, it's the Federal Information Protection Standard. Um, 140-2, you have to register. They have a bunch of nerds like me go through and make sure that this encryption standard is difficult to break, that there are certain things that it meets, and then they certify it. And so many of the vendors have a 140-2 encryption uh, certification for their encryption process. Um, and I recommend that you look at some of these standards because unfortunately some of the older encryption standards have been broken um, by nerds who wear bad guy hats instead of good guy hats. And so even if you have it encrypted, if they know what standard you're in, which they typically will discover, they can run known processes and tools against it, decrypt it on their own and use it. But we start with the high critical data. And often for smaller companies, you might only encrypt at first the high critical data. And why? why? Why would you only do the high? Well, because the problem with encrypting data, and I don't want to call it a problem, but the challenge with encrypting data is it makes the data larger. And it makes the computer work harder to use it. Because even if you have the key, which decrypts that data, um, the computer has to do a couple extra steps in order for that data to be used. So it can slow things down a little bit. Now, as time goes on, that slowdown is very hard to notice in modern systems, but it still exists, especially with older or smaller or free or no cost systems. So you, as a business, you need to begin to decide how far am I going with my encryption and what kind of performance am I looking for? So, many smaller businesses stop 
with the initial piece of the high critical data. So what does that actually look like? Well, so we've been using Microsoft as the example because it's the one predominantly people use. And again, I know there's other solutions out there, but Microsoft literally, it's, a, it's, a, it's an option box. You can set certain folders to be encrypted and through OS365. And if you have your license for OS365, you're already paying for it. So it's just a feature you turn on. Now, there are places you can go to see what that feature looks like if you would like to attempt it on your own. But most of you are probably working with an IT provider. These are some of the questions, and we'll talk more about it later, that you begin to talk to them about so you understand what they're doing for you and how it can be done and what the reporting and things are. So this is for data at rest is what I'm talking about, where we're changing a fo folder so it's an encrypted folder. Uh, some of us probably have already done that on our cell phones or whatnot. But there's also something called encryption in motion. So we have data at rest. Data just sits in a storage somewhere and isn't used too frequently. And then we have data in motion, where the data is constantly moving through email or just getting sent through different parts of our network applications that we're using, whether it's an ERP system or, or not, are moving this data around. And so investigating encryption while data is in motion is important. So there are two protocols, and I don't want to get too geeky with everyone, and, uh, and I understand that, but th this, is, this is kind of an important thing. Talk to your IT guys or consider when data is being moved, do you know if it's encrypted or not and at what level? So there are some older protocols out there. Um, the two principal ways you see data encryption happen in motion, and these are things that most people don't think about, are when you look at a web page and it says HTTP colon backslash backslash. That's just unencrypted public. If you look at HTTPS colon backslash backslash, that means there's some encryption behind it. Okay, So that's one example of how common this is. The other is um, if you have an IT provider, and for those of you that don't, um, there are different ways to investigate this. But if you have an IT guy or you're working with an IT provider, they can look at um, your protocols for uh, file transfers. And there are two um, that, that are, should be used and are commonly default used now in Microsoft and stuff for data transfer between servers and, and workstations. And that's TLS, transport layer, and SSL, secure socket layer. Um, and these... Um, these are encrypted means of communication data between workstations and servers and endpoints. And um, right now, uh, not, again, I'm getting a little nerdy here and I apologize for that. Um, it should be up to 1.2 at the least. Um, that's probably default for most Windows 10, just so everyone knows. If you're on Windows 10, you're at TLS uh, 1.2. Um, so uh, with Microsoft, uh, with uh, Windows 11, they have not moved default to 1.3, I don't think. I still think it's 1.2. 1.3 will be uh, the new one coming out in, I think, three months. Um, and then the other thing is, for some of you, you might be purchasing in, uh, encryption through a key infrastructure, known, and you're leasing it out, and there's certificate authorities. I don't want to talk too much about it. I just, brought it up. I just want to bring it up for an endnote for anyone that's using it. Just be careful if you're doing certificate authorities. Um, there are different kinds. Uh, this is really an offline question that I would like to answer um, because I don't think it affects most of the people here, but I just wanted to bring it up. And the third and the one that probably most affects uh, uh, people here is encrypted email communications. You have an option by default in Microsoft to encrypt emails. There's actually a checkbox you can click, and it'll just send that email encrypted to your companion. They'll have to install some, a little certificate that comes with your email, and uh, then they'll be able to see the, the communication. I would use this for critical, critical documents of data. If, if you're moving it through email at all, this is something you should use. Um, this would be like if you're passing a drawing or a recipe list or a pricing list or anything, and you have no other means to do it, Internally, like some, some larger companies use secure FTP. They have a website that's all s secure. You click a link and you download it. But if you're a smaller company and you're just moving this to like a partner or 
you know, someone you maybe subcontract with or you share a project with and you need to move this information, don't send it over open email. Click the encrypted box and go through that process. There are great, great resources at the end of this presentation that I will give you that will show you some of the tools you can use. Um, please use them. Uh, really as simple as that can save you so much grief. Uh, if your email account gets, uh, we've all seen it where we've seen someone's email account get picked off and hacked. If you have your stuff encrypted right away, that, that can save you so much grief just out of the gate. So uh, when we talk about data storage and encryption, there's a couple other things we want to talk about. When you talk about a data storage consideration, you need to talk about reliability and accessibility. So there's really two or three, three ways to look at data storage. You have the personal data storage. I have my laptop. And for some small businesses, that's all they have. They, I have my laptop. This is what I work off of. So is your laptop encrypted? Well, if you have Windows 10, you also have the or 11, you have the ability to turn on something called BitLocker. It comes for free. You already have it. BitLocker encrypts your laptop. So if it's stolen and someone breaks into it, they need the key for your BitLocker to access the data. And it's, it's no cost to you. So I would encourage you as a small business, all of your employees should be doing that with the workstations you provide. Um, if you're a larger company and you issue out company, uh, laptops, same thing. That should, be, that should absolutely be in place. You know, if someone loses it, you have a sales guy who goes off into a motel and someone steals it out of his bag, doesn't matter. They don't have the BitLocker. So even if they have his username and password, they can't see anything on the machine. So the next step is you have a server. Now that server might be virtual or on-premises. More and more frequently, we see it in the cloud, right? It's virtual. You, you lease space out with some provider for storage. Um, is, that, is that reliable and scalable uh, and accessible to you in all cases? Something to consider when it comes to data. Now remember, security isn't just protecting the data from someone taking it from you. It's also protecting yourself from having someone stop you from getting to it. So something to consider with a cloud provider. And while I, most people in the industry will tell you cloud providers are increasingly a good way to go for a small business, and it is, I want you to at least when you take on a cloud provider, if you do, to consider for yourself, what happens if I lose internet access? How do I get to my data? What do I do? You need to think about this because if you do lose your internet, which sooner or later someone's going to run in an interruption, you need to know what your backup is or where you go to get to that data. So these are questions you should ask yourself. Encrypted or unencrypted, we talked about how encrypted data is harder to steal, and I mentioned the FIPS 140-2 standard. Um, but scalability um, is important. So I don't think a lot of businesses, when they first start out, understand how much data they're going to accrue in a short period of time. So I think what's going to happen is you'll find that your data needs are going to grow fairly quickly, especially as your business grows. And your data storage solution, before you spend money on any data storage solution, you should take time to think about how much is this going to cost me in six months? How much is this going to cost me in a year? How many is this going to cost me in 18 months based on my projections? So you want to protect yourself in that place too, because one of the worst things that can happen is you reach the end of your data storage, and then either files are not being saved or written. Servers sometimes do crash when this happens, especially on-prem ones. That's less a problem now. In the old days, if a server ran out of storage space, it would just quit working, and it was awful. Um, that's less the case now. But that can still become a huge problem, and attackers it's not so much a means of attack now, but 20 years ago, one of the principal ways to attack a Unix box, which is a type of server, would be an attacker would get on that box and just start writing text files. And they just dump as many text files as they could because Unix boxes back in the day, if you hit a certain storage limit, the box would start rebooting itself in perpetuity. So that's, uh, that's very problematic for depending on how it is. And believe it or not, we ran into this in the military, and I don't want to talk badly about Uncle Sam, but unfortunately, the, one of the things about the DoD is it does not move very quickly when it's upgrading systems. So it had a lot of servers that were like 30 years old, and 
running like weapon systems. So like you'd have to work on these boxes and like if you weren't careful, you could get them to reboot just by not clearing them out. Um, backups and recoverability. And so I mentioned this earlier, backups for small business is so important. Not just where my data is and how I've secured it and all of these things. What happens if that data goes bad? Can I recover my last good known configuration? How long does it take me to get it? Where is it? Is it encrypted? These are questions you need to ask. I think some of the mistakes people make when they look at cloud providers is they think, no, oh, it's good, it's in the cloud. Okay, true. Most likely they have, <laughs> most cloud providers nowadays, they're backing up your data periodically. They, they do what's called a differential backup every night, for instance, they take a copy. Now it's more like every 20 minutes, but in the, going back, it used to be like every day. They would like take a copy of your data and it would be, they would only copy what was changed and then once a week they would do a full backup of the data. So they'd copy everything. And so what's that mean to you guys? Well, the question I have for a business owner is, okay, you're in the cloud and you know that you have backups of some kind. Do you know how frequently they're taken? Do you know how to get to them? Do you know if you have problems with them, who do you contact? Do you know the time to restoral for some of this? Do you know what your service uh, agreement says in regards to accessibility and accountability? Have you asked any of these questions? Or did you just assume this was all gonna be taken care of? Because I promise you, it probably is gonna be okay, but don't you wanna have the answers to those questions before something bad happens? Don't you wanna have an idea in your head of what that looks like to you and your business when you need it to matter? instead of going into it blind and having to learn all of this stuff after the fact, I promise you that the difference in that time will matter to you if something bad happens. We're summarizing some data security with some numbers here. Um, I don't like to scare the pants off people. All right, it's a bit of a lie, I do like scaring you. Um, the reality is um, role-based data access, only 46% of small businesses are using it. That's why you're being attacked all the time. Data encryption, 44% of small businesses are using it. That's why you're being attacked all the time. Training on data security, which we're about to talk about, 34% of you are training your people at all. That's why you're being attacked all the time. And I saved the top one because I wanna talk about this. Multi-factor authentication. Let's talk first about what it, is, what it is. I'm sure many of you have heard it. Some of you are probably already using it. Multi-factor authentication is the idea that to log into a system, you have to have more than one piece of information. The old school way of looking at it was something you are or something you have and something you know. Those were the three forms of authentication. So the idea of something you know would be a password. I know my password and my username. Put my username in, put my password in, boom, I'm in. What we've discovered is obviously that's not very secure and people are getting broken open all the time. So uh, multi-factor has become the most important thing. Now there are many different solutions for multi-factor authentication. Some of them are apps you download right on your smartphone, right? And you can just, it'll ping you and it'll say someone tried to log into this device, it'll give you a little number, and then on the device you'll put the little number in and boom, you're good to go. Or you put your fingerprint, however it works. Microsoft, Google, these are free. Once you have a license and you're already using their product, it's free to turn on. Now there are more robust options where they can give you a little key, a UB key that you carry around. Um, but the multi-factor is the idea that you will have something, so like that, that cell phone or whatnot, where it says, okay, we got a password attempt, but we don't typically see this from you. So why don't you authenticate again with, the, with your cell phone and just let us know that you're good. Um, this way, multi-factor, is going to stop a huge percentage of attacks onto your business. It is so important to implement, especially for key people. And by key people, I mean anyone with administrative privileges in your network or people who have access to highly sensitive data. Um, that is such a huge one. Now again, there are so many different solutions to this, 
But if you're running in a Microsoft infrastructure, you don't have to pay for it. You're already paying for Microsoft, so it's there. So I highly recommend you turn it on. Um, and also, I hate to say this, but I would turn it on for your Netflix, Facebook, LinkedIn, all of that. Turn it on, turn it on, turn it on. Uh, again, the goal here is to make yourself less and less and less attractive as a target. And these people are looking at your social media first. So if they begin to attack your social media and they notice that this is really hard to get in, you have two-factor, they might just move on to someone else. So again, the idea of dissuading people before they get to anything serious.